In chapter three, we're going to focus on cellular structures. Um, so looking at the parts of the cell, uh, and we're going to cover these learning outcomes. So defining cytoplasm, organelles, and the cytosol, describing the function of the plasma membrane, defining the term semi-permeable, describing uh, each component that forms the structure of the plasma membrane, uh, including a description of the integral proteins. Uh, we're going to explain how the plasma membrane is considered to be a fluid mosaic, and then describing the structure and function of each subcellular organelle. So to begin with, in Chapter 3, they discuss nutrients. Now, nutrients, by definition, uh, basically substances that are needed uh, as either structural materials or as sources of energy. And so all the nutrients that we find in our cells and in our bodies are divided into two categories, macronutrients and micronutrients. Now, normally these terms describe um, the size of something, at, whether large or small, but here they describe the quantity that's needed. So macronutrients are typically needed in large quantities or large amounts. These include water, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Micronutrients uh, would be those that are essential in minute or small amounts. These include vitamins and minerals. Now, in the previous unit, you talked about these macronutrients, uh, water being important for dispersing nutrients, uh, even dissolving and eliminating waste. We know carbohydrates are major sources of immediate energy. We know proteins uh, contain amino acids that are used uh, in a lot of our chemical reactions actions. And then fats we know are our long-term energy storage, also there for cushioning and insulating our body. The micronutrients, vitamins, uh, most of the time they play the role of coenzymes. So they're helping our enzymes speed up reactions. And then minerals there for fluid balance, muscle contraction, nerve impulses, uh, bones, and teeth. So all of these nutrients that are listed here are things that our body needs, whether in large quantities or in minute amounts. So when we think about nutrients, one of the big things uh, uh, that's very popular right now are nutrient supplements. So just a quick question to think about is do you use any of these supplements? Or maybe not that you use them, but have you at least heard of these like ginkgo and kava, ginseng, melatonin, coconut water, the list goes on and on and on. And so it poses the question that are these nutritional supplements, these nutrient supplements, these dietary supplements, are they actually helpful? Because when you look at the statistics, approximately $6 billion is spent by Americans a year on these different supplements. You, know, you think about vitamin supplements and mineral supplements. And two-thirds of the American population has taken at least one of these at a certain time period. So the question is, do these actually work? Do these actually improve health and athletic importance? Well, in order to, to answer that question, what we first need to understand is we need to understand the basic structures of a cell, kind of how those work, and then we can start to tackle the question of, are these su supplements actually worth it? So to begin with, um, and this is in your textbook section 3.2, so if you flip over uh, to page 59, looking at some of the first cell structures. So we start with cytoplasm. Uh, cytoplasm is basically the inside of the cell. It includes the cytosol and all of the organelles that are found in it. So everything that's inside of this outer barrier is considered to be the cytoplasm. Organelles are subcellular structures that are found in eukaryotic cells. Remember, eukaryotes, these are cells that have a nucleus, and they perform specific jobs. So organelles are to the cell what organs are to our entire body. So they all have specific jobs that they do in order to keep the cell functioning. The other part of the cytoplasm we said is the cytosol. It's a semi-fluid that everything sits in. So it's a semi-fluid, a watery matrix that all these organelles sit in. And it contains salts and enzymes uh, and, of course, water. Now, we said that the cytoplasm is everything inside of that outer barrier, so what is the outer barrier? Well, the outer barrier is what we call the plasma membrane. Uh, you'll want to know that plasma membranes are found in all cells. So eukaryotes and prokaryotes alike all have plasma membranes. Their function, first, they define the outer boundary, so they are the outer barrier. And by being the outer barrier, they isolate the inside of the cell from the external environment. Not only do they isolate the cell, but they also determine which materials are allowed to go in and out. So when we talk about these nutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients, it's the plasma membrane that decides whether they can go in or they can go out. 
So if we talk about this concept of materials or nutrients going in or, or going out, one of the things that we know about the plasma membrane is that it is semi-permeable. Uh, other textbooks would call it differentially permeable or selectively permeable, which means some molecules are allowed to come in and some can't. In the same instance, some materials are allowed to go out, some can't. So it's very uh, selective in what's able to move through this membrane. Now, this plasma membrane or this outer barrier is composed of four basic structures. Number one, a phospholipid bilayer. Two, what we call sugar chains. Three, proteins. And then four, cholesterol. So let's look through these really quickly. First off, it's composed of a phospholipid bilayer. Well, the word bilayer would automatically mean that there are two layers. Uh, and those two layers are made of phosphates and lipids. Now, uh, when we talked about lipids before in Unit 1, we introduced you to the terms hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilic obviously meaning that it loves water. Uh, hydrophobic means that it does not. So when we look at this double layer, um, the hydrophilic regions are called heads. And they're going to be found on the external surface as well as the internal surface of the membrane. The reason the hydrophilic heads are aimed where the water is is because we know that they deal easier with water so that we can have maximum exposure to the water that's on the outside of the cell as well as to the water that's on the inside of the cell. In between those hydrophilic regions, you have what we call the hydrophobic tails in the center. And these hydrophobic tails are found away from the water, because remember they fear water, and they help aid in this selective permeability that we discussed earlier. Uh, the second structure of the membrane are the sugar chains. We know sugars are basically carbohydrates. Um, and what these sugar chains do is they actually provide a unique fingerprint for every cell in your body. Uh, these can be made of glycolipids as well as containing glycoproteins. And so by giving your cells a unique fingerprint, it allows your body to recognize these cells as being what we call self cells or foreign cells. Self cells are the ones that belong to you, and so they should have your unique fingerprint, and they should be allowed to stay in your body. Which means cells that we consider to be foreign cells, like bacterial cells or things like that, they would not have the unique fingerprint on them, so your body would recognize them as not belonging here and would hopefully get rid of them. A third component of the plasma membrane are proteins. Um, proteins have several important jobs. They carry out enzymatic functions of speeding up reactions. They can serve as receptors, so receiving messages from outside sources. They can also help to transport materials. And if you look at this image, the proteins are the green structures that are found embedded or just found on one side. Now, proteins here can be either integral proteins or peripheral. And the main ones we're concerned with here are the integral proteins that are found scattered throughout this membrane. They actually go through the whole thing. So we have six types of integral proteins. You'll want to make sure you know the difference. So the first type is called a receptor protein. Uh, job of a receptor protein, obviously, to bind to chemical messengers uh, and bring these messages in to the cell. The second type are enzyme proteins, obviously carrying out speeding up reactions. Third, we have channel proteins, which form a channel or a passageway to allow certain materials to go in and out. Fourth, gated channels that only open and close to allow certain materials at certain times. We have cell identity markers, um, which distinguish, again, our own cells from foreign cells or self cells from foreign cells. And then cell adhesion molecules that are there to bind one cell to the other. And then the fourth component of the plasma membrane is cholesterol. You'll remember from Unit 1, cholesterol is a lipid, and specifically it's a steroid, which is a type of lipid. They're found in animal cell membranes, and they add as an extra structural component. What we know about cholesterol is that it hardens or stiffens the membrane, uh, so it helps to become a structural component there. Um, a couple last things that we wanted to mention about the cell membrane here is that the cell membrane is considered to be a fluid mosaic uh, because it's composed of both lipids and proteins. These lipids or proteins are continually moving, forming kind of a mosaic piece of artwork here that is fluid because they're constantly moving.